nation under, under God, God indivisible, with, with liberty and justice. And And now, in light of the activities of the past week uh, that we're all aware of, uh, I thought it would be appropriate for us to have a few minutes of uh, retrospection or reflections on current events, possibly how they tie to events many years ago. So, uh, George Stiftinger will uh, do this. Thank you, Don. Can you hear me all right? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the opportunity for the Abington World War II Memorial Association to gather for a few hours of reflection and remembrance. And as we acknowledge our responsibility to remember those killed in action during World War II, we also remember those who have been killed in the recent cowardly acts in New York City, Washington, D.C., and Western Pennsylvania. Lord, we commend your mercy and compassion those whose lives were unjustly taken by those who embrace violence and hatred. We pray for the families and friends of the victims. May they know comfort and have hope that you, the source of all goodness, will welcome them, the loved ones who have died. We thank you for our health, and we remember the sick veterans who are being cared for in hospitals throughout the country. We also remember those injured in the recent acts of cowardice against our country. We ask your blessing on those present who are suffering either personal or family sickness. We pray that these remembrances will stir us to action so we can better serve you and help alleviate the suffering of those devastated by the recent attacks on our liberties. We also ask your blessing on the farm and police and other emergency workers and volunteers and rescue units that they can cope with the horror that confronts them every day as they search for survivors and bodies of the victims. Amen. Uh, quite a bit to cover tonight. And now we have quite a bit to cover tonight, and uh, so without further ado, our speaker for the evening, Eugene Geyer. Good evening. This is a story of the 90th Bomb Group of the 5th Air Force, who in the Southwest Pacific, and we nicknamed the Jolly Rogers. I will tell you the story of my life as a listed man attached to the intelligence section of the group and squadrons. I joined the outfit in May 1942. The 90th was slated to go to England, but in August 1942, he received orders to go to the Southwest Pacific, Southwest Pacific Theater. I joined the group at Barksdale Field, located in Shreveport, Louisiana. President Bush stopped there last week as he was getting away for covering. My only recollection of Barksdale Field was a beautiful French colonial barracks with the red tile roofs. This was a complete change from the wooden barracks that were hastily built all over Army bases. Our group historian called it the Shangri-La of Army Air Bases. In June, the group moved to Greenville, South Carolina for training. Our bombing mission, we did our bombing practice at Myrtle Beach. Myrtle Beach at that time was a bombing range. Today, it is a golf haven. At Greenville, we received new pilots, bombardiers, navigators, out of training school. One. This is the range of which I participated with the 90th Bomb Group. The area you see encircled, can I nope. get back, John, Don? Here. No, back, no, oh. forward. We need to hire a better. <laughs> the area you see, there you go. Oh. this is the area 
but we covered up to Japan. We started the war at Iron Range, which is the northern tip of Australia. I'll talk to that. We had one squadron over at Darwin. Then we went up to Port Moresby, went over to Dovidor, Nadzap, Biak, which is 60 miles south of the equator, then on to the Philippines, and this is Mindoro where we were stationed, right here, and then up to Ieshima, wherever Okinawa is, we're probably around there. This is the area which I fought the war with, all of this. Okay, Don. That's our slogan, and we're pretty proud of it. Go ahead. This is Willow Run. In August, the group moved to Willow Run. This was a plant that Henry Ford built to produce B-24s. The reason we moved there was for political reasons rather than training. The plant was experienced labor problems and it was felt that the presence of an active unit would instill patri more patriotism with the workers. There were over 1,500 men quartered in one hangar. Our cat car cots were all in a row. If you looked up and down, you saw these cots head, up, head to foot all the way down with an aisle in between, going across the whole width of the hangar. Nothing but cots. There was no mess hall, so we had to eat outdoors. And this is a picture of me eating in field rations, and this is right within the city of Detroit. We're just outside of Detroit at this point, and there are field rations. You see our mess kits, which we had to clean up with hot, 55 gallon drums of hot soapy water, and then cold water. As I stated before, we were slated to go to England. And on August the 18th, we, we turned in all our wearing uniforms and issued khakis, and in 24 hours, we were on a troop train on our way to the West Coast. As we traveled across the country, we stopped in small towns. The steam engines had to stop for water, and the townspeople met our train with cookies, coffee, and soft drinks. Whenever we stopped, the MPs would get off the train and the time the machine guns be sure that none of us would go AWOL. We finally reached Camp Stoneman, which is in California, at which time we were issued O3, Springfield O3 rifles, and which came from the World War I and gas mask. We left Camp Stoneman to board a troop ship in San Francisco Harbor. The embarkment was right out of the movies. The railroad cars were blacked out and moved right on to the pier in total darkness. With the rain and fog, we boarded the ship. Our ship was the Republic, a leftover from World War I. Few of the men had ever been aboard a ship or even seen an ocean. As we left San Francisco Harbor, we, we, part, we were part of a small convoy consisting of four ships and two destroyers, with a blimp accompanying us till nightfall. With inside of the harbor, there was a sub alert and the destroyers dropped death bombs. Other than that, it took us eight days to reach Hawaii. When we were close, when we were in sight of Diamond Head, the ship sounded general quarters. Uh, Navy men would know what that means. A Navy PBY plane aircraft sighted the submarine, and again death charges were dropped, and we continued on to Honolulu. We boarded narrow gauge railroad cars and pursued it on to Hickam Field. September 1942, Hawaii was in a wartime footing. The Hawaiian Islands were in a blackout condition. At all times, we were required to have our helmets and gas masks on our persons. There was a curfew that st started at sundown. On the days off, we went downtown to Honolulu and Waikiki Beach, always accompanied with our helmets and gas masks. We had daily missions out of Hickam Field, and in one of the missions, we did a search uh, Captain Rickenbacker from World War I, his plane went down south of Hawaii. And we did a search mission. It's called a Y search mission. You use the letter Y, you go up and you go left and right, up and down, until you reach the top of your Y. So the planes would be covering all the area. However, it was not our planes that discovered them. A PEY discovered them, picked them up, and brought them back. When we were stationed at Hickam Field, in our barracks were closed lockers still containing the Hawaiian-type clothes that were left, left over from the former occupants. On the bunks was an application 
for the veterans of foreign wars. As we're now eligible to join, the, as now we, of course we were in Hawaii, and at that time Hawaii was a U.S. territory, not a state, we were considered eligible for the veterans of foreign wars. The stereo still had bullet holes when the Japanese strafed the barracks as the soldiers were running out of the barracks. Bullet holes pockmarked all the buildings and bomb holes were filled with earth. The airplane hangars were still wrecked from conditions since, 19, since December 7th. Uh, I went to Hawaii later for a visit and I got on the Hickam Field and the fellow who took me around took me to his office, which happened to be the barracks where I was located. And as I walked around, the bullet holes on the staircases are still there, and the commanders of the 7th Air Force said they will never empty, never fill those bullet holes, and all the bullet holes on the side of the buildings are still pockmarked. However, the ground holes, the holes of the bomb holes were filled up. Taken Field is next to Pearl Harbor and I was able to visit the base and saw the wreckage that had not been cleared as of December 7th. When I had leave, I would visit Waikiki Beach. The beaches were covered with barbed wire. However, there was a small opening in front of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. Oh, there was something here. Uh, it was in front of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And from, and the only things left was the Royal, the Royal Hawaiian and the Moana were the only two health hotels there. Everything from Moana all the way down to Diamond Head was nothing but jungles. <laughs> I'm missing something here. Here we go. Excuse me. November 7th, we boarded a Norwegian freighter and was named the Torrens. We were accompanied by five destroyers and two battleships. They were the Colorado and Maryland. These battleships had just been repaired from December 7th action and were on their way to, the, to join the fleet in the Southwest Pacific. The reason Torrens was able to, co to com accompany the con convoy was because it had a top speed of 27 knots per hour and not as slightly larger than a mile. Two events occurred to break up the monotony of the sea voyage. The first was that two battleships got 20,000 yards apart. And as you look over the horizon, you can see the top of the battleship that was over the horizon. And then the two battleships, to test their range finders, start shooting at one another. Now, the, the battleship close to us, the shells landed a ship's length in the wake of the ship itself, which is pretty close, but pretty good shooting. We were slightly off of that. And then they would do night missions, and you could see the glow of the shells as they went through the sky. They did this for two days. The other thing, event was, as we passed the equator, we were introduced to the ancient and honorable order of shellbackers. I don't know if anybody knows what a shellbacker is, but we were shellbackers. King Neptune presided over the event. Some of us, not me, were covered with a mixture of slime, ketchup, and other messy stuff, and then dumped into the pool on deck. Then the water hoses were sprayed over one and all of us and everything. We got soaked to the skin, but I received my shellbacker card. We left the fleet at Suva Harbor in the Fiji Islands and proceeded without escort to Australia. We had a fright on this trip. One night, we were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and the funnels caught fire and lit up the whole sky. The whole ship was lit up, and thank but thankfully, no Japanese, no Jap suddenly saw us, and the fire was extinguished. We departed in Townsville. It's a small town in northern Australia. It's in the semi tropics. It's quite warm, and the southern hemisphere is now approaching summer. We were bivouacked in the Armstrong's paddock, a horse pasture. We slept on the ground, and our punches substituted as a bed sheet. The only good thing was that we were able to take a shower with fresh water after three weeks of saltwater showers. Our meals aboard the ship was canned food, and we were able to get down, we were able to go into town and have the famous Steichen eggs, which is a well-known dish in Australia. However, the Thanksgiving dinner that we had was canned tomatoes with pork and beans. 
We left Townsville during an air raid and then boarded a liberty ship called the Cleveland Abbey. We traveled inside the Great Barrier Reef for Iron Range. That's not there. This is Iron Range, right here. This is the Carl Sea, nearest Port Moresby. Now, you don't have the whole map of Australia, but. When we stopped at Iron Range, I could see palm trees and jungles, but no sign of civilization, not even a hut. However, there was a dock, and I remember saying to myself, we can be getting rough here. However, that was the target, and off we went. I remember the Tarzan picture where Tarzan jumped off a ship and we went into Africa and then nothing but trees. Well, this is what that looked like. Nothing but trees in front of us. I knew the airfield was called Iron Range. Imagine the United States upside down and the northern part of Florida is the Cape York Peninsula. There is no civilization north of Corinth, which is pretty far down on that map. I'll show it to you on another map. And the city, the last city on the peninsula, it's the last civilization there is, there is about 500 miles of jungle between Cape York and Carnes. The Iron Ridge airstrip was a dirt runway cut out of the jungles about 100 miles south of Cape York. It, 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 Iron Ridge was the most inhospitable in place. This is an example of what we had to fly. This is the beginning of the war, we're going into combat. This is the runway that we had to use. You can see how the engineers cleared away, that was the runway. And there's your, there's your jungles. And this, at the top of that would be about 150, 200 feet. And this is a thickness that we had to live in. As I said, as I read history of the war, I know that, it, uh, I know that it did not, I know now, that we were losing the war to Japan in January 1943. There was no way that the Air Force Command would send a group into Port Moresby, New Guinea. The Japanese were, were about 50 miles away on the top of the Owen Stanley Mountain Range, which is 13,000 feet high, which bisects New Guinea. However, the 32nd Division and the 41st Army Division stopped the Japs and drove them back to the Carl Sea. I wish to make a quote about how Washington thought about the Southwest Pacific. And I quote, General Hap Arnold, excuse me, who is a general of the whole Army Air Force. I quote, my aim is to keep your forces in sufficient strength to enable you to support yourself defensively and to carry out your limited offensive against the Japanese. Now that's, I found this out after, after the war. Our camp was right in the rainforest with a canopy of trees about 150 feet high and our, making our camp completely unseen from the air. Our mess hall, tables, and benches were all made from topical trees. This is a picture of what our camp was like in northern Australia. We had a Dutch kitchen. Food. And this gives you an example of what we were living in. My first night there was all terror. Before going to get me to sleep in my cot, I was told that there were death adder snakes in the camp. A bite from a death adder will kill you in a couple of seconds. All my life, I was frightened of snakes. Needless to say, from my terror. When I woke and was still alive, my fears subsided. And another, th another thing was that I had uh, on duty to dig a latrine. And I thought to myself that I am the first person since the beginning of time to be digging into this particular piece of ground. The jungles were filled with flying foxes, white cockatoos, large pythons, 12-inch centipedes, malaria, mosquito, and dengue fever. A ritual in the jungle, and preparing to go to sleep, first you examine your blankets and sheets layer by layer to make sure that none of the centipedes or scorpions or black widow spiders had crawled into the warmth of your bed. You tuck yourself in a mosquito netting. The mosquito netting is a solid sheet around the bottom that you tuck in around, all around your cot. And so you're completely enclosed. However, there's always a mosquito that gets inside the net 
and buzzing around to keep you awake, to keep you from falling asleep. All of these mosquitoes were the Anopheles, which carries a malaria parasite. The ritual, this was a nightly ritual until we reached the Philippine Islands. Upon waking in the morning, you note that the, pre uh, the previous, you note that the previous mentioned insects did not crawl into your shoes. You always shook them out, and you shook your shoes before putting them on to make sure you, were, you didn't even gave up wearing stockings. But you want to be sure that no, none of these parasites got into your shoes. One day, I picked up my barracks bag and found a tarantula the size of my fist under the bag. In the rainforest, you do not know if the sun is up till noon. The trees are so thick, and the forest excuse all horizontal sight. There are cases where men have left camp and could not find their way back. In open areas, we had anthills 15 feet high. This is, well, let's, let's go back one time and they could see what the jungle was like. And these were our tents inside the jungle. Next. This is an anthill. Here's the size of a person, one of the GIs. And there were hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds of these in open areas. One evening, 30 of us went for a swim in the ocean that was about 10 miles from the camp. We loaded in trucks and jeeps and headed to the Great Barrier Reef. The tropical waters at night have luminous particles that light up in the foam as you walk through the waves. It's the most beautiful sight as our legs and arms of all of us, it seemed to light up the whole ocean. It must have been around Christmas time when someone suggested that we sing Christmas carols. Now you have a picture of this. The headlights of all the vehicles were covered with mud and gave off a glow like a yellow light that resembled a fireplace. And there we were, balls naked, singing Christmas carols. Now remember, this is December 1942. As I stated before, we were losing the war. Also, we were isolated in Cape York Peninsula. There was nothing below us. And suddenly, there's an alarm that the Japanese were going to invade the Cape York Peninsula. We took all the 50 cavalry and machine guns off the planes and formed a perimeter around the base. We were given extra ammunition for our 03 rifles and waited throughout the evening and night, but in the morning, was determined that it was a false alarm. Food at Iron Range was corned beef hash, which we call corn willy. It, it was the prime food of the day, day in and day out. And the cooks used to figure out different ways of making the corn willy so they would be palatable to us. Our bread was baked by the Australian bakers with, with raisins, which were actually cooked insects. You know, we, you know we, we were completely isolated. This is the beginning of the war. They didn't care about us. We didn't know it at the time. We had to live with what had, what we had. While at Iron Range, we lost three air crews due to missions. Tokyo Rose was beamed to the Southwest Pacific. We heard her playing American swing music. We welcomed the music as it broke up the day. She also mentioned that the Japs knew that the 90th Bomb Group was located at Iron Range. We made up airdrops to Australian coast watchers. And you, you know the story of coast watchers from South Pacific, the show South Pacific. Well, these were Australians on New Guinea. They were in the mountains and observing Japanese troop movements on land and reinforcements coming in on barges. This <laughs> is something. One morning we had roll call. Now we were completely isolated from anything. So there's no way anyone could go anywhere. Still, we had our roll call every morning. Now, each morning, there was a tree about 20 feet round, and all the men going up the hill rolled for roll call would urinate around that tree. And I mean, this is every morning. During the months of January and February, the tropical rain season started. It rained almost 24 hours a day. We looked for the dry spell of one or two hours in a 24-hour period. It, it is, it, I, you cannot imagine what it's like to have rain coming all the time with no breaks, just these small breaks, just confined to your tent. And we 
we used to shower outside her tent. The intelligence office and other officers, which is administration and operations, had the had chairs and uh, bulletin boards in which black widow spiders had spun their webs behind the bulletin boards and under the chairs. However, as far as I know, nobody was ever bitten by black widow spider. By the way, they're a size bigger than your thumb, and you saw the big red hour, uh, hourglass on the bottom of these black widow spiders. They're supposed to be poisonous, but luckily nobody got hit. There was a river close by the camp, no is Iron Range now, we were once swimming. However, there were cro crocodiles in the river. This was corrected by throwing hand grenades into the water. The concussion would scare, scare them away, and also the fish would be stunned, and we collected the fish for meals. However, we still had a gunner on top of the bank to shoot any crocodiles that may have been coming, that has not been stunned. As the weather cleared, we boarded a Dutch a Dutch island steamer, it's a little small boat, to cross the Carl Sea to, on the way to Port Mosby. On this trip, we stopped in hangar, hammocks. This room was, about, was also our dining room, and the hammocks were stacked up when we weren't sleeping. The trip was uneventful. And we still got New Guinea here. Oh, here we go. This is the Carl Sea right here. And we're now getting to Port Moresby. I'll get to David Dora later. Port Moresby. We reached Port Moresby. We were greeted with the largest daylight air raid of the war. There were 45 bombers and 60 fighters. They bombed our runaway about a mile from camp and started fires by hitting some oil drums along the way. After the bombing, P-38 fighters on the next trip of ours attacked the Japanese formation and destroyed 13 bombers and 10 fighters. Now, there's one thing that just reminds me that I didn't talk to you earlier. Opposite our camp in this valley was a bomb dump. And had that air raid hit that bomb dump, I wouldn't have been here now. And we were thankful we went further up. Major Bond, who flew 38 who, who, who flew B, B-38, oh, excuse me, I'm getting dry here. Major Bong, who flew P-38s, he became an ace, an ace during this battle. To be an ace, you have to destroy five enemy aircraft. And he went on to destroy more, than, more enemy aircraft than any other flyer in our Air Force. To this day, he has reached, no one has reached that amount. Many of the battles we have with air. Somebody, he, he destroyed over 40, aircraft, 40 enemy aircraft. The clouds down. And that's KP. That's a typical village in New Guinea. That's a mirror drop, which I'll come to later. There is the air, the beautiful white clouds. If you've been in the tropics, these beautiful white thunderheads are beautiful clouds, but dangerous. Outside of the cloud is raising up to better than 100 miles per hour, and the inside of the cloud, the downdraft, is about the same. One hotshot pilot decided that he would fly through one of these clouds. One of our friends was on the plane. He said that the plane went down into a flat spin, and the centrifugal force was so great that he was pinned against the side of the plane. He thought he was going in. But somehow the pilot was able to pull the plane out and out of the spin and let land the plane. But the plane could not be used again. The plane was bent and could not be scraped. It had to be scrapped. It was during this time that the Japanese were going to reinforce northern New Guinea. There was a convoy of 22 vessels, of which 12 were transports and the remainders destroyers and escort vessels. All the aircraft in New Guinea attacked these ships, and the, and the, destroyed most, and the convoy was destroyed. The 90th received the Battle Star. This became known as the Bismarck Sea Battle. 
uh, I had before something on the battle stars. We had the 90th Bomber had 13 battle stars, starting with Guadalcanal and ending with the Air Force of Japan. On missions while at Iron Range in Port Moresby was armed reconnaissance flights. <coughs> A single plane which was, would fly a prescribed route in northern New Guinea to observe enemy land buildup and naval and barge movements. If one of, it was one of these missions that a plane discovered the Japs that resulted in the Bismarck Sea Battle. We lost many of our, many of our planes in these missions. As the Japanese air strength built up, and as more planes they outnumbered, they were outnumbered by Jap fighters. One plane landed in a base with over 100 bullet holes in it. When our planes landed after a mission, the Salvation Army always greeted the planes with coffee and donuts. The crews received a shot of whiskey from the medics. Some of the crew members saved these shots and be taken to one lump sum later on. Don, I'm, going, I'm up to, what do you have next, Don? I don't know. What do you have on? <laughs> All right, this is a bombing missions. This is a cruiser. So some pictures of some of our bombers. This is a cruiser with a direct hit. Next, on. This is skip bombing. Here's a bomb in the air. Here's a bomb in the water. And on here, well, you can see some of the crew members. And you had to resort to this, because sometimes you're coming up too high, you couldn't catch the Japanese with, they would be maneuvering out. So the planes came down to the deck and dropped their bombs as a torpedo, and it would go right into the water, and you'd have the air bombing. Next. Here's a destroyer, direct hit on a destroyer. These are all Bismarck Sea Battle. Here is a Japanese shrine. Here's a NACAC position, command post. Here's your jungle. Go ahead, Don. Are you going the wrong way? A uh, native village. In November, we were lucky to attend a native festival. This was a spear-throwing contest, the target being a tall stand of coconuts, and the native chiefs were dressed in full regalia, regalia made up of bones and large sea set, leaf shells. Tall feather hats and the faces and bodies were covered with white shells. And now we have some more pictures. This is just one of them. This is the throwing contest it was a post instead of a shell, so I got it wrong, and continue. There's a, there's a chief with his shells, there's some more of them. There's a whole group of them. They did, did a war dance for us. It was January 2nd, 1944. And here we are, here's some Australians who were there. Okay, next. Our summer a crew had a bailout in New Guinea, and luckily we landed near this village. And with the parachutes, they made the Jolly Roger emblem. And what you can see in this picture was the natives were made, each two natives were made up the eye sockets, and two other natives led head to toe to make the mouth. <laughs> and we were able to recognize it. And, uh, this, uh, this photo was appeared in Life magazine at that particular period. Uh, it was, I'll get to it later. While I was in New Guinea, I had a bout of chills and fevers. I either had malaria or dengue fever. I was sent, the doctor sent me to a field hospital and in this field hospital, there were a lot of beds. The lights were maybe 40 watts. It was very, very dim. And they tucked us into mosquito nettings. And you'd have a bout of fever and then chills. And when I got a chill, my teeth would shatter. And I laughed, laughed to myself. Here I was in the jungles, in the tropics, and my teeth were shattering as if it was zero degrees outside. One night, a nurse came under the mosquito netting to give me a rub. I couldn't care less whether she did or didn't. But when she gave me the rub, she appeared as an angel. And after the rub, I felt much better because 
when you're through one of these bouts, you don't care whether you live or die. It is so, takes so much out of you. And after that, I was given quinine pills for the rest of the time in the tropics. The landing strip and our tents were in a valley between two ridges. One day, I was on top of the ridge, and I looked down and saw a B-24 buzzing our campsite. It was a strange sight to look down on a plane flying. One bus so low that the propeller wash blew down one of the tents. This was a common sight whenever there was a successful mission. That's what the pilots would do. They'd come down and buzz to show that it was all right. One minute night, there was always a Japanese plane flying high and, and occasionally would drop a bomb. We called him Russian Machine Charlie. One night, the plane was caught in the beams of a searchlight. And all the other searchlights on top of the ridge hit him. And after, and then after which, the anti-aircraft guns would open up, and we could see the burst of shells exploding around the plane. But none caught him. And meanwhile, all the ground personnel were shouting, hit him, hit him, get him, get him. It was like a ball game. All those lights formed a cone on the plane. And the exploding, and the, all the exploding around the plane, but he got away. At this time, there were no night fighters in the Allied forces in Southwest Pacific. Being intelligence, being in the intelligence section, I read a lot of interpretations of Japanese diaries. And one diary in particular of deceased Japanese says that the spirits of the Japanese, dead Japanese soldiers, who the writer was asking why they were not physically appearing to kill our troops. Now you saw the picture of the, par the parachute jump. On September 5th, which is my birthday, I went to the airstrip and saw the U.S. 503rd Parachute Regiment loading up 78 C-47 transports. The parachute drop was in Nadzab Valley, inland from Ley. The Australians were leading our paratroopers coming in from the land side of the valley. I believe that this is the first parachute drop of the war. There was little resistance. Our troops marched down the valley to Ley and, and on the way to the ocean, and where they were greeted by ground troops of the Army and the, uh, Army and landing as reinforcements. This is the first action by MacArthur to pass Japanese troops rather than fighting in the jungles. By the way, in Ley is where Amelia Earhart left for her unfortunate vision before the war. At this time, before this happened, we used to say Golden Gate by 48, and we really believed it because the war was going so slow. In October, we moved over the Owen Stanley mountain range, and our crews would no longer have to fly over 13,000 feet to fly their missions. I used to give a crew member my canteen of water, and when he returned, I would have a taste of cold water. We never had cold water since Hawaii. At this time, we also removed the Isle of Drab paint from our planes so that it was, they were nice and shiny, and they increased their airspeed by 25 miles an hour. crew I did that. We had planes go to Australia to bring back whiskey, Coca-Cola, candy, milk, and PX, and the PX even bought an ice cream machine. While in David Dura, it was Christmas 1943, we had a Christmas party in our nest tent. Now we're, on, we're now on the north side of New Guinea. We're no longer Port Moresby. It was David Dora. If you remember the map, I pointed out David Dora and Port Moresby. We're now in David Dora. We took all the liquor from the Elizabeth's Club and filled 15, ke 15 gallon kettles with scotch, another one with whiskey, another one with rum, and all diluted with a lemon drink. And we drank our mess kits from our mess cups, which is, holds about a pint. Needless to say, there were about 200 men. Who, had, who were pretty well soused, and singing all kinds of songs, which I won't mention. <laughs> Suddenly around midnight, we heard Christmas carols coming from the chapel, which is about 100 yards from us. Suddenly, we sobered up, and that was the end of our party. MacArthur's strategy of island hopping, leaving Japanese strongholds back, oh, 
I'm sorry, I had something else. Our heart jets, strongholds. Our roofs gave aerial support for all these landings. We bombed the beaches further inland against gun emplacements and troop concentrations. The landings being made by the Marines and Army. We had recreation in McKay, Australia. We flew there. It was my first leave in almost two years. We had hot, hot showers. Now, you've got to remember, it's almost over, over a year that we never had a hot shower. And but I can, you can't express the, the feeling of having a hot shower after having nothing but cold showers. We had fresh food, steaks, good old American apple pie and ice cream, milk, and recreation. This lasted about two weeks. About this time, MacArthur took Manus Island. Time, can you get a book, Matt? Here. Well, here's David Day, where we are now. This is a where they used Here's Manus Island, right here. Between New Britain, which is, these are the Solomon Islands, and here's New Guinea. And he took this base here, Gen Island Hopping. <coughs> there was little resistance, but it was strategically located between New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. Now the Japanese could not supply the small enclaves in the south and east of New Guinea. As we moved past these en enclaves, the Japanese would plant vegetable gardens. But however, as soon as the vegetable gar gardens were ripe, we would have low-flying medium bombers spray them with diesel fuel and starving out the Japs. <laughs> At Nadzad, we bombed Hollandia in Dutch New Guinea. We're now going to Dutch New Guinea, which is not owned. This is the chapel on the double door well, we heard the Christmas carols at midnight that stopped us, stopped our party. <laughs> Go ahead, Don. That's our camp in Nadzab, which is very nice. Go ahead, Don. There's a B-24, and here is the nose, what they call a glass house, which only had a 30 caliber machine gun. Later on, Colonel Rogers took a turret from the rear of the plane, and you can see it on here, and put it on the front, and thereafter all B-24s were built with a turret in the nose and a turret in the tail. At Nazab, at Nazab Air Base, we are now built from Hollandia, which is a Dutch New Guinea. It is a major air base, base with hundreds of planes. There was a major airstrike involving all the heavy and medium bombers, as well as P-38s with good top cover for us. The, the, the B-38s were the P-38s were able to reach us because they had extra fuel tanks, and they destroyed over 400 enemy planes. While waiting in the chow line, we noticed two fighters practicing a dogfight about 5,000 feet. Suddenly, one of the planes lost power and collided with the plane below. It was something like this: it, it's, you see these planes going around, then suddenly one plane and the other one's coming up, and all of a sudden you seem to lose altitude and went right into the other plane. We collided. A ball of fire resulted, and when the planes were starting to fall out of the sky, all of us in the chow line were shouting, bail out, bail out, get out. As the planes were halfway down, a sudden, we suddenly saw a parachute, but only one parachute as the plane hit the ground. It is now the beginning of 1944. We have three heavy bomb groups in the Southwest Pacific now. We were at Bini, we were the only one. A few of our airmen were captured by Japanese, and after they were interrogated, they were decapitated. Some also were, were in Tokyo prisons, and they died when we were bombing Tokyo. I received this information after our, at our, one of our annual meetings. In April 1944, our troops landed in Hollandia and we are now in Dutch New Guinea. While we're in Nadzab, and I've got to read this, one day a large officer's party, we had a large officer's party, and they invited the nurses and Red Cross ladies. The ground personnel was unaware of this party, and our showers had not been installed, and I was taking a horse bath, which consisted of two helmets of water, one with soapy suds and the other for rinsing. There I was, 
in the front tent mate, where I was naked, and a road that ran beside our tent, and passed our tent, with loads of these females. It happened so fast that there was no reaction on my part, and the ladies just laughed. But this, but this by the way, this was the first females we had seen in over in months. Don, I think I, right now, I think we have the pictures of the Japanese uh, airfield and the bombing mission, the bombing? Yeah, there it is. This is a reconnaissance photo of an air base, a Japanese air base. Next. We would give our bombing, bombardiers, maps like this, which would show the headings that they would make and what they would see coming in. And here's an airstrip right here. Next. And this is what the other side of that map, the shoulder runway, and the revetments. Next. Uh, this is a radio station in Formosa. Formosa is Taiwan Island, but it's now, my speech is always Formosa. It's a powerful radio station. We found it through Photo and Terp. Right in here, this is a shadow of, a, any, of an antenna that the Japanese had. That's how we found out there was a radio station. These are smoke, smoke, smoke pots. And there's an any aircraft position. And these are some of the things that I did in Photo and Terp work. Next. This is Formosa. This is a city in Formosa. And here's a bombing pattern. Now, one day our mission was to destroy a city. So three squadrons with demolition bombs hit one section of the city. I'll say like this. And the fourth squadron had incendiary bombs. And they were coming down here. And the incendiary bombs would catch fire. And all the demolition was ripe for destroying the, that town. And this is one of the missions that we flew. Next, I think, is the radar. This is a picture. Now we're later in the war, and we got radar now in our planes. This is the tip of, northern tip of, the southern tip of Formosa. And I thought you'd like to see what a picture looks like of radar and what our, 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 our engineer would be looking at. And we also, all our pictures had this on there. Go ahead, Don. This is a bombing pattern. These are planes, they're in their mission, here we are, and this is the bombs that they dropped. Go ahead, Don. All pilots in New Guinea, fighters as well as the bombers, were given this card. This is a card that would be carried on a person. And this language down here is the pidgin language for the natives of New Guinea. And it says on here that if they would take the flyer to a Australian base, they would get a reward. Next, Don. This is also for the natives. And it says here, Japan I know got. The natives would be working hard and not get any money when they're under Japanese territory. And here we say, you work long, get your money. And these are Australians paying the New Guinea natives. Next. This is Japanese propaganda that we dropped. Next. This is another Japanese thing that we dropped. Now here you can see this is the background of Japanese language. And I have the interpretation of what that says to the Japanese was dropped to the Japanese. Next. This is Balik Papan. This is Nor and this is Borneo. And this is a landing. These are barges going in, and we're going to land in here. Telling us on, and where our bomb sites were. Next, this is the air raid in Balik Papan. Oh, by the way, this is Borneo. I don't know if I mentioned that or not. This is in Borneo. It was a 12-hour mission that flew from Biak to here. There were bombo tanks. Half the half the bomb. There were four compartments in the B-24 for bombs or, bom or Bombay or gas tanks that were believed that it would, could fit into the Bombay, and then the other half would be bombs. 
It was, it was over a 12-hour mission. And this is a result of a bombing mission. Next. This is BIAC. I'll come to this later. Let's go back to NADZAB. When our shows was... No, that's right. You know, when our shows was installed, it was always outdoors. And the cold water supply came from the nearby mountains. I remember lifting my mouth to drink the cold liquid. Jack Benny and Carol Landis entertained us in Nadzab in August 1944. In August, we moved to Biak, Dutch New Guinea. It's a very small island. Here we go. This is the equator right here. We're 60 miles from the equator. When we arrived at our encampment, the Japanese were still in the caves about a mile inland. The artillery was still shooting into these caves as we were setting up camp. No showers had been installed, so we had to bathe in, in a knee-deep log creek about a mile from camp. About 100 yards inland, there was an opening of a large cave. So I swam into the cave and went inside. It was about 50 feet high and about five, 75 yards wide. And the top of the cave had a beautiful blue-green coloring, the reflection of the sun rays from the water from the top of the, to the top of the cave. I still remember this beautiful coloring. Another day, we were bathing in the same water when an MP and the jeeps start getting us to get down, get down, get down. And we, sh we shouted back the heck with them. They were waving their hands to motion us to get down, and we just didn't pay attention to them. Suddenly, a GI truck appeared, and there was Bob Hope and his female entertainers. Suddenly, about 100 of the GIs dropped to their knees. At the same time, the entertainers covered their eyes. It happened so fast, they were all dumbfounded. <laughs> One night at Biak, a native asked us, how come we were feeding a Japanese soldier? He was in the standing in our chow line. Now, we couldn't tell the difference between a Japanese or a Biak native, but the Japanese died into our chow line, and we now captured our first prisoner. This is a prisoner we captured. <laughs> From Biak, we started to bomb Borneo, where I showed you those pictures. It was a 12-hour mission. We had P-38 fighters covering the mission. It was in one of these missions that Colonel Charles Lindbergh accompanied the fighters in their P-38s and instructed pi fighter pilots on the conservation of their fuel for the fuel consumption, because it was a very long fight for the P-38s. We were now in flying distance to start bombing Mindoro, Mindanao, which is the southernmost island of the Philippines. We also bombed Palolillo, north of Biak, a Japanese stronghold. While at Biak, we now received Black Widow spiders, which were night fighters, to stop the Japanese night bombings. These are the entertainers that entertain us in Nazap and Biak. We have Jack Benny, Bob Hope, Jerry Brown, and Carol Landis. And Gary Cooper came, but we don't have a picture of him. The chaplain found out I could play bridge. So I became part of a foursome with him and his staff. One member of our, our flight crew who was a gunner, who was a gunner in who was a gunner fought in World War I. He, he accumulated 300 combat hours with 27 missions under his belt and received the Distinguished Flying Cross. When MacArthur landed on Lady Island in the Philippines, we were busy bombing other islands to keep the Japs occupied and also searching for the Japanese Navy. One, in one mission, we discovered the main Japanese fleet in the Bruno, Bruno Barber, Bruno Bay in Borneo. Excuse me, it's starting to get dry. In January 1945, we moved to Mindoro Island, just below Luzon. Our campsite was right on front of the infantry defense perimeter, with machine guns all facing toward the ocean. Seems like they were expecting a Jap landing, which never materialized. We then moved, they moved out the next day. Our camp was located directly in line with the runway. 
One morning, as the planes were taken off, there was a few hundred, uh, only a few hundred feet above our tents. The roar of the engines seemed to explode in our ears. Since, uh, since in the past, a few B-24s didn't make the altitude and crash, a few of our personnel left their tents early in the morning and went up to higher grounds. There are three clash crashes that I'd like to make comment on. When a plane takes off, the flaps are half. Now, I don't know whether ladies understand this, but there's a, behind the wing is a little flap to help the plane have more lift. So they usually use half lift, half flaps to take off. On one plane, the co-pilot pulled a flap lever to fill, fill flaps. This is equivalent to putting on the brakes hard, and the plane went into the ocean. Luckily, there, there, there was no bomb explosion, and the whole crew escaped. Another plane attempting to land lost power and seemed to float down to earth and settled about 100 feet in front of our tent. Another plane headed for a mission crashed on takeoff about a mile up inland. As I was walking to the crash site, I suddenly heard a Bing Crosby record being played from a native hut which was on stilts. This was a very primitive area and I was surprised to hear Bing Crosby singing. I visited a cousin who was stationed lady, which is about two mile, 200 miles from Enduro. So I caught a flight over to visit him. And I spent the night with him, and his tent mate was in charge of the PX, post exchange. And they were, he had some cigars, so I bought two boxes of cigars, visited my cousin. Then I caught a ride back on a B-24, back to Mindoro. We were flying at night, no problems. We're coming in for a landing. Engines came down. You could feel the plane slowing down. And suddenly, you heard the roar of the engines. And the engines taken off. It seemed that the pilot mistook the revetment area, which had lights on both sides, where the planes were parked, the B-24s were parked, or were being repaired. And there was a string of lights. And he mistook those lights for the runway. Luckily, somebody caught it and set him up again. Well, he went up and got his altitude and came around for another landing. Now he suddenly realizes he's too high, so he side slips. Now a side slip is your plane is level. You go like this and you lose altitude, it's like falling, and then you could level off. So he side slipped the plane, plane, and you could feel the plane catch. You have a free fall, and then you could feel yourself being caught. And he still came in for the landing. However, he landed too far into the runway. And next thing you know, we know, we're in the back of the plane, heard this grinding sound. He went beyond the runway and into the ground after the runway. And that was the grinding sound. And he lost his nose wheel. We didn't know it at the time. But fellows in the back of the plane with me were jumping out of the waste window. Stephen and, uh, Cox, please come to the circulation desk. Stephen Cox, please come to the circulation desk. Well, I jumped, I grabbed my cigars Jumped, well, I found out later I had the cigars, but not at that point. I went to the waste window, which is about two feet by three feet, and I'm about the same size I am now, and put my foot on the lower part of the wing and jumped. Then I suddenly saw I was about 15 or 17 feet off the ground. I hit the ground, the other fellows ran to the end of the runway, the side of the runway, where we had ditches for rain runoff. They jumped in there, and I jumped into them afterwards and waited for the plane to blow. The plane did not blow. I was waiting for the plane to blow. Suddenly, the guys up in front say, start saying, are you guys in the back all right? <laughs> now, we came out of the side and said, yeah, we're all right. <laughs> Suddenly, now, all of a sudden, the tower realizes that the plane that landed was not coming back to a revetment area. So they turned on the spotlights and looked down the runway and saw our plane with the tail up in the air, something like this, ground, like that. Now the ambulances and fire engines and everything else start coming down the runway toward us. When they came, of course, we were all all right. Now I had to get my stuff, the other stuff that I had in the plane. And this is when I realized how high I jumped. I had to stand on the top of an ambulance 
then chin myself up to the waist window to get into the plane to get my gear. The natives of New Guinea, New Guinea I mean, excuse me, Mindoro, Philippine Islands, had a drink called tuba. It was made of fermented coconut juice. It was a very powerful drink, and we sort of enjoyed it. <laughs> the native language is Tagalog. We picked up a few of these words, and the native females would be doing our laundry. Before this, we had to do our own laundry. When we asked how much they wanted, they would answer, ukumbala, ukumbala, which means it's up to you, whatever you want to pay. However, they, were, they had their price, and we offered a, a too low a price. They shook and told no and said no until you gave them the right price. One night, we had a Texas barbecue. We had a lot of Texans in our outfit. They dug a pit six feet by 10 feet, about two feet deep. And they burned wood all day long in there until they got good hot coals. And they butchered a steer and basted the meat over the coals, oh, I don't know, have any hours with a spicy sauce. And then about 11 p.m. or closer to 12, they start cutting the meat up, and let me tell you, that was absolutely tasty. In 1945, I moved up to a town in the Philippines on Luzon called Florida Banca. It was a van section. The Philippines invited us to a school for dinner and dance to celebrate the victory over the Japanese. There were young ladies at the dance, and they were accompanied by the duanas. And we had a 15-course meal, and I always had a rice, a little small rice given to us between each meal, which I guess equivalent to bread. Our camp was guarded by Filipino guerrillas, because as the American forces were going down the Lingayen Gulf, that's the infantry, the Japanese fled into the hills on either side of the valley. And then later on, they would come down at night and kill any U.S. personnel in their tents. One day we had to go to Manila for supplies, and the city of Manila was completely in ruins. MacArthur Boulevard, which faced the Manila Bay, had, which had beautiful white marble buildings, were destroyed. Don, can we get those Filipino pictures? Oh, no, all right, let me give this one. During the Battle of the Philippines, Admiral Halsey left the invasion in Lady and went north. Meanwhile, the Japanese battleships were coming through the Philippine Islands, through the various waterways in the Philippine Islands, and one battleship put this salvo on a carrier. Don, you want to pick up on that? Yeah, that's, the, that's the Princeton. Joe Nemec was in the destroyer group protecting the... These were the CVEs were off the... Uh, off the Philippine Islands, that lady. Three, three carrier groups. Right. One of the battleships that got through, that's a salvo from them. Right. I picked this up from a Navy picture. And I thought it would be interesting for everybody that to see was, something like that. That was from our first lecture here four years ago. <laughs> so here. Okay, Don, let's go to the next one see what we have. Uh, this is Indo China. And one of our missions was the bombing of bridges in Indochina. Go ahead, Don. This is Hong Kong, which is one of the targets that we hit from the Philippines. This is Hong, Hong, Hong Kong Bay in China. Go ahead, Don. This is White Cloud Airstrip right here in Canton. Don thought this was White Cloud, but that's a, that's a regular White Cloud. This is the White Cloud Airstrip. You see all of you, but all right. And now I mentioned Mindoro. Mindoro had the planes were taken off, and the fellows were going up into the mountains to get away from the takeoff. This is a takeoff, and this is the top of the tents right here. And there's a plane, and that's every morning more than 20 planes would be taken off that way. Here I am with a fellow friend with a captured Japanese flag. Go ahead, Don. This is Manila. These are my pictures that I took along the bay. These are all the marble structures that they had there, that they destroyed. This is a regular army picture showing the destroy of Manila. Here they're done. Here's another picture of the destruction 
of Manila. Okay. Here I am in Biak, tops of the captured tank. Go ahead, Don. This is Cregador. We bombed Cregador, and then they, they had another parachute jump to take, to take Cregador. This is in Manila Harbor. Go ahead, Don. I'll come to this later. Our, our supply, when I went into the middle, our, our supply group had to stay overnight in Manila and couldn't find an army base to sleep. So we spent the night in Santos Prison. This is a prison that the United States citizens were imprisoned. And I can still see the porcelain insulators all around the prison that held electrified wires. From Mendoza and from Budapest, we bombed Shanghai, Hong Kong, Canton, Hanoi, Formosa, Formosa. This is very interesting on the Doro. The plane not on reconnaissance was returning when a heavy fog covered the airstrip. I happened to be in the radio shack and heard the conversation between the tower and the pilot. The tower was listening to the engines of the plane and they were line up the planes along the runway, but we could not see the plane. Finally, the tower, the tower called to the pilot turn on his landing lights, and they were able to see him. The tower took the plane down to a safe landing. This is something you see in the movies, but this actually happened. Being the advanced group, I was out of contact with all the information of the world. But I passed a radio shack, and I found out that the President Roosevelt had died over a week ago. In one of our missions to China, we had maps that showed safe areas in China. One of our planes got hit over Canton and headed for a safe area. And they bailed out over the safe area and returned to our outfit in about a month. This proved that the intelligence that we had was excellent. We had movies, this is miscellaneous. All the movies were held in the theater areas with red benches. The movie was usually an old picture, and it came in three or four reels. After each reel, we'd stand up and wait until the next reel was inserted into the projector. We had movies about twice a week. Since the missions were over water, now we have this picture. The Navy had submarines stationed along the routes of the mission. If a, flew, if a crew or a fighter pilot was down, they would be rescued by a sub or a PBY, a Navy PBY Catalina. In a lot of parts of the world, we had B-17s with a boat attached to the undercarriage. The plane then could be dropped, the plane would then drop the, the boat into the water. I mentioned that. Shanghai was the last mission. We now left the Philippines and we moved up to Ayashima. Now, Ayashima is a very small island off of Okinawa. We were transported by LSTs, and you've seen these LSTs on B-Day pictures, the ships that the doors open up in the front. All of the group equipment was stored in the main hold, and there was no room area for sleeping. So we were quartered on the top deck. The top deck was covered with 55 gallons, drums of aviation gasoline. We had our cots to put on top of the drums and use the pup tents to shelter us against the rain. One night we had a submarine alert and the escort vessels were dropping depth bombs. And all the LSTs who were in line straight ahead made a right turn so that they would have the rear of the boat facing this and making the smallest target for the sub. Since it was the blackout conditions, all I could see were the ships to the right and to the left. I had once seen this, this maneuver in the movies with the battleships. We hit a storm, and the LST has no keel. So the ship would roll left and right. And as we were in the storm, I leaned over the rail, and I could see the round bottom of the ship as it listed to the left. As it righted itself, the water seemed to cut reach almost to the top of the rail. We had a lot of sick shipmates on that, that storm. When we arrived at Ayashima, 
There was nothing to do, so a few of us decided to jump off the ship to take a swim. After we hit the water, the ship's captain called for us to get out of the water and buy some, uh, because the bay was polluted. There was a ship's ladder hanging down to the bottom, but it was the first run was just out of our reach. How to reach a ladder. My first effort failed. I finally swam about 10 feet from the ship and swam as hard as I could. And upon reaching the ship, with my left hand, I hit the ship in the momentum, and I lifted my right hand, and I was able to grab the bottom rung. And then I chinned myself up and was able to make it to the top. And Ernie Powell, we have, there we go. Ernie Powell, the beloved correspondent of the European theater, was killed in Ayashima. And the 77th Division built a memorial for him. Years later, when I visited Hawaii, I went to the Punch Bowl War Memorial. And I, it was pointed out to me, his grave site. And I found out later he was buried there because he was a World War, event, World War I veteran. We set up intelligence offices. We had intelligence set up our intelligence with the targets that we were going to bomb in Kyushu, which is the southernmost island of the Philippines. The message, we, we, <coughs> which, uh, I mentioned it. The landing, beach landing was an area that was, we were going to bomb. And there was a flat land, and the end of that was mountains area covered with caves. Our troops would have been slaughtered. Now, this should make a notation here. Right? In Saipan, I don't know if you ever heard of Suicide Click, Cliff, Cliff, where the native of Saipan, rather than be taken prisoners, jumped off the cliff. And the whole civilian population of Saipan jumped off that cliff. Now, I read later on that the inhabitants of Kyushu were going to die trying to save their land. And luckily, the H bomb or the atomic bomb stopped this, because we'd have lost a lot of men there. Can we get the uh, emissaries? This is a plane that the Japanese emissaries came to Aishima. The top pictures I've taken is a colored photo of the Jap plane. The bottom one is the Japanese emissaries. This is a B-25 accompanying to, to make sure that they wouldn't be doing anything. Then he landed. Then the next one shows, these are the emissaries after they landed. And they are going to the C-54, which were taken down to the Philippines to see MacArthur. Now, the MacArthur had the runway sentries, the runway sentries posted every few feet. And all these sentries were over six feet tall. The Japanese were then transported to the C-54 over there. This is C-54 with the emissaries leading to go to Manila to meet MacArthur. On August 25th, we flew an armed reconnaissance flight over Japan with other Fifth Air Force units. To observe the Japanese who were following the instructions have been given to the envoys. Among the prisoners liberated were 25 Jolly Roger men. Now, the 90th Bomb Group still lives today, and it's the 90th Space Wing Station in Roaring Air Base, Wyoming. And the squadrons are still the same. There was a 319, 320, 321st, and a 400th squadrons that made up the 90th Bomb Group. And even today, today the missile, we once had a reunion out there at the 90th Missile Swing Wing. And that's the end of my talk. But do we have time for Shirley? No, questions. Yes. Oh, is there any questions? Yes. You said you It was on here? Yeah. No, that was in one of the books that was published by one of our, I had got that out of a book here that was published. How did you make them? when you made them during the war? Oh, they were printed. There was a printing office. Every place they had a printing office to make maps. Because I, once I gave some, some PT men came up and I gave them some maps. This is the beginning of the war. The PT didn't have very good maps of some of the areas. And we had better maps. So the PT uh, sent some men up and we gave them some maps of the area they were operating. Go ahead. Yes. Did they just uh, skip bombing? 
Yeah, no, they were B three twenty fives. The B twenty fours wouldn't get that far down the deck. That was a B twenty five. Yes. Uh, did your group uh, participate at Bismarck Sea against the uh, con the uh, convoy? Yes. Oh yeah, that was definitely that. We definitely uh, we, we, we found on that certainly. Other Who were these emissaries? When you said the emissaries, they were Japanese emissaries. They came out of Tokyo. After the emperor sued for peace, we instructed them to send emissaries, and these were the people who would be signing the armistice of the war. Uh, Mr. Geyer, yes, uh, sir. Um, it seems that what, what I've read is that uh, it's very difficult for high-level bombers to bomb ships that are. Uh, uh, turning and twisting to trying to avoid bombs. That is true. So but we don't forget, we were not like in Europe. We were not bombing at 25,000 feet. We would be bombing at 20, 20, about 10, 10,000 feet, I would say, we'd be doing the bombing. But even then, you, you are correct. We did not, we're not very successful in our bombing missions with the, with the heavy bomber groups. Okay. But there are times when we did that first cruiser, that you saw the first picture with a cruiser being hit in the side, that was from the V-24. That was our colonel who hit that bomb, that ship. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, sir, for your presentation. Thank you. Anyone else? You, yes. I didn't fly. I was in intelligence, and I was a ground crew all the way through. I went on some observation missions, but I, did, I was not a flyer. Yes. No, the B-24s had a ball turret, but we didn't use them during the war. It was easier to use it, put a gun where the uh, photo hatch was, a photographer's hatch, and put a gun there. But it was very rarely that, because the Japanese very rarely attacked from underneath. And then we also, later on, at the beginning of the war, uh, there was very little we could do. And when they, the planes went out on the individual reconnaissance missions, they were pretty much on their own. And it was just the side gunners and the rear gunner and the pea shooter up front until we got the terrorists up front. The pea shooter, it was a 38 caliber gun at the, at the front. But the. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Every, every mission, there was a photographer. Every, every, every group of three planes would have one photographer. Yes. Yes, I have up here, I have a bombing mission a report. I have a, a type report of a bombing mission at RELAC. And you're welcome to read it if you would like. This is what we would send to Bomber Command and concerning RELAC. Oh, yes, that was a major target. Anyone else? OK, my wife has a, sure, you want to? My wife has a little bit that she had during the war that I think you may like. Don seems to think it was very nice, and she would have heard speak on it. Oh, you gotta, you gotta take me up, Don. Okay. Good. Very good. Fix it up. My knees are stop shaking, I'd be okay. Take on to this or? Uh, oh, yeah, I'll just put it on here. Hi, I'm Shirlene Geyer, Jean's wife. And I'd like to tell you, <laughs> I'd like to tell you how the civilians uh, did their best here in the States while the men were out fighting. When Jean was in the South Pacific in 42 and 43, I was in high school. <clears throat> We helped to save, collect fat, if you remember years ago, we collected fat in tin cans, and we, we worked with the, uh, what did they call them now, I forgot, ration cards, remember the ration cards? Chocolate and coffee and sugar and all that, we helped with that. One day when I was in school, the teacher sent me and another girl down to see the, visit the counselor. We thought she was calling us down to maybe change our classes. When we got down there, there were about 10 other women, 10 other girls in the room. The counselor said she had called us together because in our questionnaires, we had, that had been, uh, we had filled out about two months ago, we had all indicated 
that when we graduated high school, we thought about going, we had planned on going into nursing. She said the Red Cross was instituting a new service now. There was a shortage of nurses and nurses' aides, and the Red Cross, was, Red Cross was starting this program to train nurses' aides. We would be trained and then incorporated into the hospitals. <coughs> so we all signed up because it sounded like a great idea, and we wanted to do something. We thought we'd get out of school, but of course it didn't work that way. We went to, I was assigned to Methodist Episcopal Hospital, which was in South Philadelphia on Broad Street. We went for four weeks training. Among the things they taught us were to take, first of all, to make beds with hospital corners, which my mother put to use as soon as I came home the next day. We were turned to take uh, TPRs, which were temperature, pulses, and respiration. We were also in, in, uh, shown how to give back rubs and also instructed on, on other things. For example, when we were fill the, the pictures by the t on the patient's and tables, we were told not to fill them full, three quarters, so if they fell, they were tipped over, they wouldn't all spill. And then, of course, we were told that anything the nurses asked us to do, we're to do. And we were assigned to the wards, only the women and children's ward, never the men's. Well, the first day on the ward, because I was tall, I was as tall then as I am now, and they assumed I was strong. So they gave me the job of emptying the bedpans. In those days, the bedpans were those heavy porcelain bedpans. They were weighed a ton, especially full. Anyway, you took a gurney or a litter, you pulled, put four on, then four on top, and ro rolled it to the, dis to the room at the, uh, at the end of the hall. You had to roll very carefully. Because if anything fell off, kid, you're on your own. <laughs> well, we did that. I did that for about five and a half, six months. And we loved it. It was great. And incidentally, if you managed to work on a Saturday, they gave you lunch. So you got to sit with the real nurses, and that was really thrilling. One day, one evening, as we were checking out, we worked, I worked Tuesday and Thursday after school. One evening, as I was checking out, the, nurse, the uh, nursing director asked a few of us told a few of us that the Red Cross had called and was looking for some volunteers to go over to the Naval Hospital because they needed some nurses' aides there. Well, the girls and I, hey, Naval Hospital, all those men, yeah, we're on. So we all signed up and we went over. When we went there, the nursing director there asked us what we knew how to do. We could, she didn't want us to taking temperature pulses and respirations. That was something for the regular nurses. But they, she, and when she heard that I was doing, had learned how to give back ropes, she said, that's great. So she signed me to the paralegic ward. Paralegic? Para, favorite? Paralegic. Para, right, OK. <laughs> and this was the ward where, unfortunately, the men had been injured in, pa in battle and were paralyzed from the waist or hips down. So all I had to do was give back rubs. My thighs were great. You had to be careful. They were funny, and they tried to grab at your skirt, you know. But on the whole, they were wonderful. They had a marvelous sense of humor. And when I would go home, I'd think, these guys are really great. Here they are, lying on this litter. They can't do anything for themselves, but they can laugh and joke and, and cut up all day long. They were really a trouble. <laughs> I would give a back rub, and I'd start at the shoulders, and I'd go down slowly slowly get through the waist, and they say, lower, lower. And I'd go a little lower, and they say, lower, lower. And I'd say, Navy regulations say I can't go any more lower. <laughs> <laughs> but they're always, you know, they're always kidding and calling you wherever. This hurts, and that hurts. Rub my leg, rub my knee, you know. I said, I never go above the knee because Navy regulations say you're not allowed to do that. Well, this went on for a couple of weeks, and it was great. Except one day I went in, it was near the end of my shift, and one, I was giving one of the fellows a back rub, and he said, oh, this is marvelous. He said, I really like this. He said, could you rub my chest and my stomach? I said, of course I can. He says, well, grab my handle and turn me over. So I bend down under the litter, look for the handle. There's no handle there, you know. I get up, all embarrassed because I thought I must have missed it. You know, something's down there and I'm not seeing it. So I, the nurse came over. She said, are you OK? You look kind of red. I said, oh, I'm fine. You know, I'm fine. And it was 4.30 or 5 o'clock, and I went home. Next day at lunch, I'm talking all the girls we meet at the lunch table, and I tell her what happened. 
Oh boy, did they give me an education? <laughs> they told me exactly what was <laughs> happen and what I should look for. Now I have to tell you that my dad was a reti retired Navy man. He was in the Navy for 20 years when he came out, retired, got married, married my mother. And his brothers were policemen until he joined the force too. Now he's home and he's as a policeman. He, when I first told him that I was going to work at the Naval Hospital, he said to me, you know those sailors, you better be careful, they're tough. And I said to my dad, oh, daddy, how can they be tough? They're sick. Oh, boy, <laughs> they're never sick. Well, this went on for a couple of weeks. And I must tell you about the ward. The ward was about 25 beds on each side. In the middle of the, war, of the 25 beds were the nurses' stations against the wall. There were always at least two Navy nurses. And there were usually two or three corpsmen. Oh, the corpsmen. Were they ever handsome? Especially this one. I'll never forget his name till I live to be 280. His name was John Tracy. Six foot tall, big blue eyes, curly hair, and a cleft in his chin. What more can I tell you? Every nurse today was madly in love with him. Every, every day at lunch, we'd say, you ask him out. No, you ask him out. Of course, he never asked any of us out. He was probably married and he didn't even care. But one Thursday, I walk in. And he's standing in front of the ward, leaning up against the table. <coughs> and he says to me, hi, I'm waiting for you. Well, I almost fell over. He's going to ask me out. He's going to invite me anything, something. No, no. So I was trying to think of something very sophisticated to say. And I said, well, here I am, you know. <laughs> so he said to me, we need your help. He says, the corpsman, his name is Porter. He's at the amputee wards. And they need a little help. The nurse is on her uh, dinner break. And, and can you go down? I said, well, I've never worked with the MTs. I really don't know what I could do for them. He said, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is take this dressing table, roll it down, and they'll tell you what to do. <coughs> so he steps aside, and there's this dressing cart. <coughs> Excuse me. So I, I take the cart, and I push it. Well, the cart has a bulky wheel that pulls to the left. So you take three steps got to stop, jiggle the cart, straighten the wheel out, pull it away from the wall, and go down. I only had to walk about six, floor, six wards down. There's this long corridor, and the wards are all to the right. So I walk down th three steps, jiggle it, pull it away from the wall, walk down, jiggle it, finally got down there. And Porter, the library is closing in 30 minutes. Copies will return off in 15 minutes. Please check out all the materials now. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear. So I walked down the hall. I finally get to where Porter's standing. And I said, Tracy sent me. He said, I know. And I'm just about to turn, make a right turn to go into the ward. And I say, what am I going to do? I'm really not very familiar with this. He said, oh, we're just doing a shirt arm inspection. You don't have to do anything. I say, oh, OK, I can do that. You know, I walk in, and the, and the cart jig, the, the wheel gets stuck, and I jiggle it. And I look in the hole in the board, and all along the right-hand side are about 10 or 12 men standing at the foot of their beds wrapped in a towel. And on the other side, all the men are sitting on their beds kind of looking out, watching me come in. I think, isn't that nice? You're expecting me. I walk in down, the, and the wheel balks again. All of a sudden, I look up again, and I realize, my God, these men aren't amputees. They're standing on their feet, and their hands are holding the towel. The light goes on, and I think, oh, my God, I shouldn't have a What am I going to do? <laughs> so what does any red-blooded 16-year-old girl do? Run the hell out of there, you know? <laughs> Ran down the hall. I don't remember even taking the, tray, the cart with me. But I get down to my ward, and the nurse comes out. Now, I'm, I'm running down the hall. I'm upset. I'm angry. I'm mad. I'm going to kill Tracy when I see him, and I'm crying. I get down the hallway, and the nurse comes out. She says, I thought I saw you. What happened to you? Got the ladies room? I said, no, no. And I begin to tell her this whole thing. I'm sure she's going to go down to the ward and scream at the, oh, she says, sure, forget. They're kidding. You don't have to be upset about that. They, they do that to all the young uh, nurses aides because they know you're all gullible. And I'm shocked. I, she doesn't say anything. She's not going to do it. And I'm sitting there and I'm sobbing. This time I'm sobbing. And she says, I think you better go home. I don't think you better work tonight. And I'll see you next week. So I go home. 
father is a policeman now. Every three weeks, he's on the eight to four shift. And this is the week he's eight to four. And when he's eight to four, we're all home for dinner because that's the way he likes it, dinner. So I get home, we're just sitting down to dinner. And my mother, I have a young brother and sister. <coughs> brother. Anything at school today? And of course, my younger sister, six years old in first grade, has a million things to tell her. So she rattles, rattles all reading, my brother. And then she turns to me, says to me, anything happened at the hospital today? So I begin to tell her, thinking, my father won't know this. He was in the First World War. <laughs> but apparently, there's some expressions that stay with every war. And the more I talk, the angrier my father is getting. And he's getting red. And all of a sudden, he's choking on his coffee. And my mother has no idea what I'm talking about. My father gets halfway out of his seat. He says, I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to talk to the nurse, and I'm going to beat those guys up. And my mother says, Charles, sit down, finish your dinner, and then we'll talk about this. <laughs> so he does. He sits down, and after dinner we talked about it. He talked about it. I listened. <laughs> he used to say, Friday morning, my mother called. She spoke to the nursing director. She said, I'm sorry. Shirley won't be able to be in for hospital service. She's going to transfer to the blood mobile. And that's another story, too. <laughs> I think due to the sh shortage of time, we didn't get one of the stories in there about the uh, picture that she, he had on his arm of the oh, gorgeous yeah. gal. <laughs> and as he flexed the muscles of his arms, you can imagine how that gal moved. <laughs> Except she said her mother would not let her father wear short sleeve shirts. <laughs> well, uh, we are going to have to close down pretty quick. I just remind you that we, we do have expenses, and we have a donation uh, envelopes in the back, which help to take care of our expenses with your kindness. Um, are there any? We do have program schedule for next month. This afternoon, we had the uh, nurse who will be speaking uh, the next time. She had 34 months in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, we also uh, have a native-born Hollander, Mia Greco, who will tell about life as a civilian under occupation. And um, so it'll be sort of a two-part story. We've lined up, uh, if you were here last uh, month, you may remember a Colonel David Pergren who spoke a little bit. He was sitting in the front row and gave a few comments. He is... Um, on the History Channel with about four different programs, and the title of his program will be Unsung Hero, Panzer Stopper. He was a colonel uh, with the uh, engineering uh, company, I guess, that uh, destroyed about five bridges that stopped the German uh, panzer uh, groups from reaching the Battle of the Bulge. I don't think he kept them all out, did he, Craig? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, that'll be, uh, it's not on our published list yet, but that'll be November 20th. We have a special program on November 6th, which is, uh, my definition of special is when we have a World War II story that's not told by a World War II veteran. This is really a grandson of a World War II veteran. He's a Pennsylvania Humanities Council speaker. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. And... Uh, his title of his program, which I have heard, is um, Poster Art of World War II. It's very good. Any other comments or anything before we shut down? Going, going, gone. All right, see you next time. Well, how'd you like it? <laughs>
Vehicle. She did that you say the November 20th is the nurse and also the uh, October 16th is the nurse oh, and the uh, Holland, uh, Native Hollander. October 16th. Yeah. Yeah.